Hey, hey, young people. This is Ms. Cooper. I want to give you some more information about your chapter five. You are going to have a quiz on Friday. It's going to be comprehensive. It's going to be from chapter one all the way through chapter five. Um, I started the video with reading the beginning of section one. So I want to make sure that we add some additional information. Um, you're going to receive some documents in your email and on the team's page. Both of these documents are extremely important. This is a graphic organizer of all of the sections that are in the chapter. I'm going I'm to read this and give some commentary on it right now. But the longest document is a PowerPoint. This is several pages of this PowerPoint. I'm going to go through it quickly and let you know specifically which pages you need to pay close attention to. So, basically, this Industrial Revolution and our objectives for this chapter uh, deal with analyzing this revolution, the social, geographic, economic, and political implications that resulted from it. So our whole goal for looking at this chapter, period, is for us to get a better understanding of this revolution. How did it happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? When was it happening? And what are the things that happened as a result of it? Okay, who are the the major players, the names that I can share in with you, the, the names that you have seen on the videos, okay, Alessandra Volta, uh, James Faraday, um, Henry Bessemer, uh, different names that have come across between the videos that I have given you and the supplemental videos, those will be important. So you want to make sure you go back and review those videos, and if you were taking the notes like I had asked and given them to me, thank you, but go back and take some notes on your own. I'm going to put some questions together probably later today and try my best to get you that in the lesson information for tomorrow because I'll have a class again tomorrow. So I'm going to do my very best to not have my mic off and messing up stuff. I'm going to do my very best to make it seamless and smooth for you. But either way, this information is what's important. So when you receive this document, there are several pages that are before this page. But you're going to be looking for the start where you see this image. Okay, this image is the beginning of the more, most important information from this PowerPoint. So it's basically talking about how the factory system changes the way people live and work. So it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. It introduces a variety of problems. See, the factories were paying much more than the farms. And this demand for goods, it rises. And there's a demand for more expensive goods because more people are making more money. So that's, that's pretty good about factory work. But then urbanization, building cities, uh, the building of cities and movement of people to cities. The growing population uh, provides the workforce. <clears throat> There's a market for factory goods. Some of the British industrial cities were London, uh, Birmingham, Manchester, and Liverpool. Uh, so the, it changes the way of life basically because people are now making more money. But remember that working conditions are different. Uh, and they have moved. They have urbanized, moved to cities. Um, in terms of the living conditions, sickness was widespread. There were epidemics like cholera. They sweep these urban slums, these people that don't make as much. Even though factory work was paying more than farm work, it was not paying more than professional work. People that entered into a higher class because they had professional jobs, it's very important that you build a life for yourself so that you can maintain your life. If you start low and stay low, it's harder to go higher. But if you can build your life, okay, scaffold it and try your best to get to a higher place in your life. And we're not just talking about having a better car or, or we have, we're talking about having the ability, the means to maintain and go through tragedies, sicknesses. If the factory shuts down, what are you going to do? These are things that I want you to keep in mind as we talk about <clears throat> the positive and even the negative components of this industrial revolution. The lifespan in one large city uh, was only 17 People were dying by the age of 17 because either cholera killed them or, you know, the sicknesses being other epidemics were killing people, like literally. Um, wealthy merchants, factory owners, they lived in luxurious suburban homes. Rapidly growing cities, they lacked sanitary codes, okay? Cities that were really big, you know, you need to take the trash out. You need to make sure we don't have sewage in the streets and make sure that the water is you know, decent to drink, but because there's so many people and, and these landlords are just getting the money. They're not fixing stuff. They're just like, okay, come live here. Stuff is falling apart. Stuff is breaking down. Now, remember laissez-faire? 
we'll do what we want. Some people are still trying to hold on to that, uh, even though there are critics at this point in time that provide more regulation. Stop letting these wealthy people do whatever they want. That's that's constantly coming up. Um, there's there's not adequate housing. There's not adequate education, and then there's not adequate fire or police protection. These large cities, somebody's fighting every five seconds, you know, in a neighborhood over here or over there. And if you don't have enough police, because we don't have, we're not taking enough taxes, or if we have taken enough taxes and we haven't properly allocated those taxes then that money goes in people's pockets and we've not yet bought a fire department. Okay, we haven't hired someone to be a fireman or a, a, an organization to maintain safety if there is a fire. That's a, that's a kind of a government or a city thing that should happen. And if, if you have a lot of people in your city, then you, should, you have the ability to tap a lot of people for the tax money. But if you're not using that tax money properly because you're just excited that you're rich now, and that's how you'll let the whole city just go down and just, you know, not even care because, oh, I'm rich, you know, forget about you. That's not good. Working conditions. The average work day was 14 hours, six days a week, year round, 12 months a year, 12 months out of, out of the year. That's every single month, okay? Lots of these factories were dirty. They were poorly lit. It, workers were being injured. And many coal miners were killed just by coal dust. The middle class were the skilled workers, the merchants, the rich farmers, and the professionals. That's what made up the middle class. The tensions are going to grow during this period. The emerging middle class, they looked down. They were looked down on by landowners and aristocrats, people who were just coming up. The old money never likes the new money because the old money feels like the new money is a competition. <laughs> okay, you're going to take my money. You've been had money. How am I here to take your money? Now, competition, you know, you can make a wrong decision and all the money that you had can be down the drain. If you make bad decisions, you can win the lottery today and be bankrupt in five years. In fact, statistics say the average individual that wins the lottery, they're, they're bankrupt within five years. Because people who have not had to deal with large amounts of money ever in their lives, it's difficult to all of a sudden have all of this money and not know what to do with it. The working class. Oh, the middle class had comfortable standards of living. The people who were the, the rich merchants or the rich farmers, the rich professionals. When I say rich farmers, I mean the, the farmers that had the money to buy those that equipment. Where they're not out there getting dirty. They got equipment. They have mules or they have slaves, okay, to do that work. Those farmers were making a lot of money. But people who were, uh, if you were not a slave and you actually worked on the farm, you were getting like pennies. I mean, it's really nothing. The laborers' lives did not improve. Some laborers were replaced by machines. This is what happens. This is the other big issue of the Industrial Revolution, people losing their jobs to machines. And whereas some people are mad about it, the people who are making money off of it are extremely excited because now I don't have to pay you to have an attitude. Okay? You don't even have to come here. And I can still get the job done. So mechanism, or uh, mechanization, that's the word that's often used. It is the transformation from human labor to machinery. Okay, or machine labor. Okay, instead of a person doing something, the machine does it. That you just buy the machine one time and you don't have to pay the machine every week. You don't have to let the machine take a day off. The machine's not going to have a go pay daycare. The machine's not going to come and complain about they don't like the, the, the much. The machine's not going to do anything but work. Um, Ludites or other groups, they destroy machinery that puts them out of work. Yeah, they get mad about these machines, these factories, and some of them start burning them down. Unemployment was a serious problem. Unemployed workers began to riot. They said, we didn't know y'all took our job. They're mad about it. If somebody takes your job, you got to go get another job. There's no reason. You know, you can go out there and argue about, you know, you took my job or the machine took my job, the computer took my job. You, you can say that, but ultimately you'll just have to go get another job because do you think they're going to change their mind? No. The industries that make money when they change the way they do things, they are going to continue to make money. And you being upset is probably not going to bother them. So you should just kind of rethink how you're going to handle that. That's what we learn from it. When we look at this revolution, we should be learning about how to adjust with change. Some of the positive effects of the Industrial Revolution, there were immediate benefits. There were jobs created that were replaceable. Uh, it enriches the nation. It encourages technological progress. Education can expand. Clothing becomes cheaper. Diet and housing can improve. Workers can eventually win shorter hours, better wages and conditions. The unions helped do that. They began to advocate for the workers, the people that actually do get to keep their jobs. Their jobs are not taken by a machine. There are sometimes jobs that a machine is there, but you still need some people. 
So those people are valuable to become commodities. And a commodity is something that, you know, you, you have to bargain for that. Okay? It can be replaced, but it's still a negotiation. The mills of Manchester. Manchester had, has labor, water, power nearby at Liverpool, but the poor live and work in unhealthy, even dangerous environments. Business owners make profit by risking their own money on factories. Eventually, working class sees its standard of living rise some. People who work and work hard and continue to work, they get to come up the ladder just a little bit. Uh, the best way to come up the ladder is to elevate yourself intellectually, as in get some certifications. Learn a new skill. Acquire um, intellectual property, artists, artwork, and things of that nature. This is how people can build themselves. The children. This is a very important slide. Very important slide. I'm definitely going to ask questions about it. The children in Manchester factories. Children as young as six years old worked in the factories. Many were injured. In 1819, the Factory Act restricted uh, the working age and hours. Pollution owls the air, poisons in the rivers, all the stuff from the factory, some of that stuff, there, were no, there was no regulation on how you had to throw that stuff away. No regulation on how you dispose of chemicals or anything else you're using in your factory. So it was getting in the air and it was poisoning the, the rivers. Nonetheless, the Ma Manchester produced consumer goods and they created wealth, but they got it off of, of these children workers. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Same people that got rich off cotton got that way because they enslaved African Americans. Okay, the Industrial Revolution spreads, uh, and it begins in Great Britain, but it goes to other parts of the world. This map is definitely going to be on there, and I'm going to ask questions about this map. So be sure you can read it, and be sure that you are familiar with the legend. Because the legend, the answers are going to be, I'm not going to give you something that you have to figure out. I'm going to give you this so you can look at it, and I want you to interpret it, okay? So if you read a legend, here the legend says, there's the cradle of the Industrial Revolution in one color. When you get this in your document, It'll be in color. But either way, you can still see the various shades of gray here. Uh, what, what's represented with industrialized by the mid-1800s, what's industrialized by the late 1800s, the weekly uh, industrialized by the late 1800s, and the industrial areas. Okay, that's, that's what's on this map. This map definitely will, will have some questions for you on your quiz on Friday. Development in the United States. The U.S. had natural and labor resources needed to industrialize. Here's a name, Samuel Slater, English textile worker. He builds a textile mill in the United States in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, mechanized, mechanized textile center by 1820. Manufacturing towns sprang up around factories across the country. Young single women flocked to factory towns. They work in the textile, clothing, shoemaking industries. This is what gives women more independence, that they can work even though some of them were children up until we had that, that Factory Act of 1819, which is definitely going to be on your quiz. <clears throat> Industrial development in the United States, later expansion, industrialization picks up during the post-Civil War, which means after the American Civil War. Civil War ended in 1865. Technology booms. Cities like Chicago expand rapidly due to local railroads. People can tra uh, travel more, get to different places quicker. Small companies merge to form larger, powerful corporations. Now, there are several other slides that are here, okay? I want you to be familiar with all of them. I know for a fact that there are certain of them that I'm going to ask more questions about, okay? But throughout this PowerPoint, anytime you see a name, anytime Adam Smith, do not forget the name, Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Util, uh, utilitarianism, these Marxism. We talked about Karl Marx the other day in the Communist Manifesto. Very important names. Socialism and radical socialism. Very important slide. Unionization and strikes. Definitely something I'm going to ask questions about. And then the Reformation of Laws, 1842, 1847, and 1904. Labor unions reform laws. Unions help get things done. Very important. So, I'm going to end this video by saying uh, I will have some additional questions sketched out for you because this was a long document. It's a long PowerPoint. So, I will have some more specific questions sketched out for you. Uh, I do want you to pay attention to those questions and go through the document on your own uh, and reread it. Uh, I've given you a, a good summary of what's in it and definitely the things that I'll be asking questions about. I'm also going to provide an additional video to give you further information. Thank you and have a great day.